as we ended 2020, as you know, we got into the stretch. And how many of you already, what is this, January 17th, 17th, whatever, the, blur, the day's blur, it's a Wednesday to me. How many of you already have been stretched in 2021? Yes, if you haven't been stretched, what is wrong with you? Are you hiding under a rock? I have been stretched more in 17 days. But I love that that was the word of God for our church and for the church, that he is going to stretch us because he wants to fill us with the most of himself. There are things that he is trying to do. And so I believe that one of the things God is doing is he's stretching our faith, he's stretching our generosity. And so we encourage everyone to go to the stretch.revivechurch.com, download your stretch card, and write some things on that card that God is going to stretch you for this year. And I didn't say God's going to do it this year because I'm not God. I want to put that timing on him. But I did say he's going to stretch you this year. And so we want to write things down on our card. And also along with the stretch we're doing for the first time in the history of our church, we're doing a special offering. Um, and this offering is designed to help us accelerate this vision to be the church of 2030 um, and to empower the mission that we have to introduce real people to the real Jesus. And that first moment, we're doing four moments. This first moment is going to happen March 28th. And what I've been asking people to do um, is take these moments, take these three-month periods and pray and seek God and go, God, what is a number that would stretch my faith? Not a number that I can work extra hours and exhaust myself, but God, what is a number I can work six days and rest one day and honor you? Come on. Hello, somebody. Rest. I got so much feedback from that message alone, stretched for less. Everybody was like, I don't like that. I don't want to rest. Well, you need to. <laughs> rest one day and let God do more in one day than you can do in the other six. And so my wife and I, we prayed we had a number, and God put that number in our bank account. Like before we even knew it, our investments grew, things began to happen. And so um, I, I know that didn't happen for everybody, but I want to just tell you that when you get that number and you have vision for that and you trust God to provide, 1 Corinthians says he'll provide seed for the sower and he'll provide bread for food. So it's not you got to give up everything. You might have to give up some Starbucks because you don't need it anyway. God didn't say he will provide seed in Starbucks. He said seed and bread. And so uh, he's going to provide everything that you need along with that. So March 28th, we're going to come together as a church online in person, and we're going to give into the stretch offering that first moment. I believe that God is going to honor his word and the prophetic words that he has been giving us. If you believe that, say amen. 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 Hey, if you got your Bible, pull it out, digital or physical Bible, I don't care. I want you to go to two places in scripture with me today. I've got a great message. Second Timothy chapter three is the first place we're going to look at together. And then first Samuel 13 is going to be our core text for today. Second Timothy chapter three and first Samuel chapter 13. It will be on the screen behind me, but I believe you need to get in your Bible as well. And as you're looking for that, I want to read you our theme verse for this learning series, Awakening Ephesians five verses 14 through 16. This is in the Amplified translation. It says, therefore, God says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He'll make day dawn upon you and give you light. I don't know about you, but 2020 was some darkness. I'm ready for some light. Amen? So look carefully then how you walk. In other words, don't walk right back into the darkness when the light shines on you. No, live purposefully and worthily and accurately. Don't live as unwise and stupid people, witless people. Live as wise, sensible, and intelligent people, making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. And in September 2020, Jordan Fudge gave us this prophetic word that God was positioning our church to try again. And so I'm going into 2021 thinking this is year one of Revived Church. I'm not even thinking about the last nine, eight years, however long we've been around. I'm thinking about this is year one, and it's not that we missed the mark. It's just God put us back at the starting line for a brand new race, a brand new marathon, a brand new victory. Come on, somebody. A brand new championship. Like There are things that we're going to do this year and and for the next 10 years, as we become the church of what year? 2030. We're going to be the church of 2030. And so last week, we learned that all you have is all you need. You need to go back and listen to that message because it sets some people free from the mindset that I've got to work extra hard. I've got to strive to be the best. I've got to, no, God's going to grace you. He's going to provide the things that you need with purpose, with fulfillment, with everyday supplies, everything that you need. His provision is more than enough. Today, I want to give you a message I've titled, Know What You Don't Know. Somebody say, Know What You Don't Know. Know what you don't 
No, I want to start in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I want to read from the Amplified Version because I believe that um, this is a great explanation. It says, every scripture, let me pause for a second, every scripture, we're talking about the Bible here, every scripture in the Bible is God-breathed. It's given by his inspiration. So we believe that the Bible is a culmination of God breathing into men and women who spoke things and who wrote these things down. It is God breathed. Sometimes he dictated things, sometimes he didn't, but it's God inspired. And here's the thing, here's the reason why you need to know your Bible as a follower of Jesus. Because it is profitable. It brings you profit. It's profitable for reproof, I'm sorry, for instruction, daily life. For reproof and conviction of sin. You're like, is this a sin? Is this too far? The scripture will tell you. For correction of error and discipline in obedience. Somebody needs some discipline. For training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will in thought, purpose, and action. So that the man of God may be complete and proficient, well fitted, and thoroughly equipped for every good work. Somebody say every good work. If you're wondering, why don't I have clarification about these specifics in my life? Maybe it's because you don't know what God's word says. We believe that the Bible is God's inspired word for us. It is not God dictating every word, but there is a lot of that. God used the characteristics of the writers to come through. My favorite uh, clarification of this is if you go read the book of Psalms, when you read about David, King David, David and Goliath, y'all know who I'm talking about? Like 13-year-old shepherd boy that went on the battlefield and killed the Goliath with a slingshot. Man, as he grew into a king and as he went through some trials and tribulations, we see his bipolar disorder come out. Like homeboy in one chapter, the first four verses are, God, why have you forsaken me? My life sucks. Just take me. Kill me. I hate this. And literally he switches on a dime and he goes, but God, I trust in your faithfulness. Your salvation will redeem me. And it's a really interesting dynamic to read David's life because God uses the characteristics and what they're dealing with, their struggles and their striving to show his grace every time. God inspires what the Bible says. The words are God breathed. We say that the Bible, the word of God, is living and active. And here's why we say that. Because if you go back to the book of Genesis and the account of creation, when God created mankind, it says he formed man out of the dust of the ground, and then he breathed his breath, and the Bible says it was the ruah breath of God, and it actually put life into man. And if you believe that God's breath, God's word, God's breathes life into you, then if his word is God-breathed, if the Bible is God-breathed, it is life as well. Bringing a whole new inspirational mindset to what is the Bible. When we look at the ministry of Jesus, he probably spoke tens of thousands of words for every miracle he did. He talked more than he healed. He taught more than he raised from the dead. He preached the word of God. Why? Because he knew miracles weren't enough. Literally, he knew they weren't enough because he would go into towns like his hometown and he would do miracles and they would try to kick him out. Miracles weren't enough. Why? Because you need the word of God. It is the foundation of everything that we do. It is profitable for instruction, for reproof, for conviction of sin, for obedience, for discipline and training how to live a holy life. Let me say it this way, because y'all are tired today. The Word of God is the most important thing you need in your life. Like it is, Bottom line, is the most important thing. All you sinners out there watching today, somehow you got on YouTube and I popped up and you were like, who is this crazy redhead? You need the Bible. I'll tell you why you need the Bible, though. Because if you don't know what God's Word says, if you don't know what the Bible says, how can you be saved in the first place? Because God's word is what inspired the writer to talk about the saving grace of God. And if you don't even know what the Bible says about grace, how can you be saved in the first place? The Bible is the most important thing that you need. But I also believe that as we continue to head, I mean, quickly into this age of information, I believe that access to information that we have will go from a current state of exponential information 
to what I believe will become infinite inspiration or information. I don't know if you know this, but Elon Musk, the um, founder of Tesla, founder of SpaceX, founder of everything that's happening right now. He is now the richest man in the world as of the date of this recording, January 17th, 2021. He outdid Jeff Bezos. Like when you beat Amazon, you deserve to be the number one richest person in the world. Like let's just say it. And he is working on something right now, believe it or not, he's working on a brain implant that will go into your brain that you will be able to access any information that you want like that. That you will be able to communicate with other people just by thinking. That there will be no more, some of y'all are like, it's the mark of the beast. I don't know, it might be, I don't know. I'm not saying it is or isn't, I have no idea. I'm not saying it. Some of y'all think the, the COVID vaccine is the mark of the beast, so calm down for a second. Like for me, I know, take scripture out of it for one second, but like for me, like that's really amazing that, that technology has gone that far. But that means that instead of exponential information where it's going to take me time to access Google, I can literally say, or I can think to myself, Google, tell me about Albert Einstein. And Google will implant thoughts into my head. And, and, and with that kind of access to all that information, though, as information, by the way, begins to transform and change and become infinite, where will the Word of God be in your database when that happens? You know, most of the problems that I see as a pastor has nothing to do with the choices that people make anymore. It really has to do with the information they choose to receive. A lot of what I hear a lot, Pastor Stephen, will you pray with me? Yeah, absolutely. Tell me what's wrong. Well, I went on Google, and um, like that's your first mistake. Well, I talked to my friend, and, and, and in other words, I got information that wasn't from the Word of God. It wasn't God-inspired. It wasn't God-breathed first. And so now I'm believing all these other things. Come on, somebody. And, and, and it's hard for me. Here's why. Because when there's a weight of information that you're carrying, God's word doesn't just come in and crush that information. It doesn't just change your mind. You have to choose to not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's Romans. Here's the thing. Why did I just spit that out? Because that verse has been knocked into me by, by my mama, by my daddy, by my grandmama, by Mr. Chris, by Miss Marcy, by Mr. Ralph. Y'all don't even know them, by Mr. Ron and Wolf. I was in church and that was beat into us over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Some of y'all didn't get that. Amen. And that's okay. Because now you get the choice to receive the word of God. God. I want to go to 1 Samuel chapter 13 with you today. We're going to look at a story about a king named Saul and a prophet named Samuel. So while you're getting to 1 Samuel 13, I want to read a, a predecessory verse, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 8, because this is going to lay the foundation for what we're going to talk about today. Samuel is talking to King Saul. He says, go down ahead of me to Gilgal. I will surely come down to you to sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. But you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. We'll read that one more time so we're all on the same page. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal, and I will surely come down to you, and I will sacrifice burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. Very clear instruction. Go to Gilgal. I'll be there in seven days. You wait seven days. I will do the burnt sacrifices. Everybody understand? Nod your head if you understand. Okay, cool. Awesome. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 13. Starting in verse 5, here's what this says. And this is just very interesting. It says, the Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Can we just agree that's an exaggeration? <laughs> they went up and camped at Micmash. I thought of a really funny dad joke. What would you call it if McDonald's sold mashed potatoes? You're welcome, YouTube. 
They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. And when the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard pressed, they hid in caves and thickets, among the rocks, in pits, even in cisterns. They would find empty giant jars and hide in jars. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. But Saul, King Saul, he remained at Gilgal. And all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days. Okay? Because that was the time set by the prophet Samuel. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So Saul said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering just as, just as, just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done, asked Samuel. And Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you didn't come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgon. I have not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Samuel said, you've done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. Because you have not kept the Lord's command. Father, we thank you for your word that it is true, living, and active. And I pray that as I preach this word in the short time that we have together, that God, it would be a seed planted in the heart of every hearer. It would not return to you void, but it will accomplish your purpose. In Jesus' name, come on, somebody say amen. You got to know what you don't know. And what you don't know is what the word of God says. When you don't know what the word of God says, when you don't know what you don't know, three major events happen. And when I say the word no, I'm not talking about head knowledge. I'm talking about intimate knowledge. I receive the word. I live in the word. I breathe in the word. I step foot in the word. Like I bathe in the word. Everything that I know is in the Bible. I trust what the word of God says. Because if you don't know the word of God, three major events begin to happen in your life. The first is this, when you don't know the word of God, you are moved by scatter. He said, when I saw that the men were scattering, they were running everywhere. Did, did you not notice that for the past 12, 13 months of history, all we've seen are men and women scattering everywhere? There, there's a movement right now of Californians coming to Texas. Welcome, y'all. They're scattering as fast as they can to get away from the corrupt government, from the, the legalization of things, and, and from the policies that are in place that are hurting them. They're scattering, and, and there's a lot of people who are living in fear right now because they are scattering. And Saul has the same reaction when he sees that his soldiers are just scattering everywhere. He makes a decision. Scatter is this. Scatter is when you don't know the word of God, you begin to be moved based on the fears of others. They're not even your fears to begin with. Like, we, can we just all be honest together? We weren't scared of the word coronavirus the first few weeks. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I was the dude who was like, we'll be back in church by Easter. Not because the president said it, but because I was like, and we'll, we'll be fine. I didn't understand it. Then all of a sudden, day by day, new information comes out. Oh, by the way, it causes blood clots. Oh, by the way, you'll never pee again in your life. <laughs> oh, by the way, you die 30 seconds after getting it. Oh, and like everything, all of a sudden, and I'm like, wait, wait, wait. And before I know it, I've got people who are scattering our church, scattering my life, scattering relationships, scattering jobs, scatter everything, everybody's scattering. Why? And, and, and like, am I supposed to scatter? When you don't know what the Word of God says about your life, you begin to, to move and you, you begin to shift and you begin to take action on everything else. Now, don't get this twisted, though, because everyone can be afraid. I can still be afraid and yet know the Word of God. Some of you are like, that doesn't make sense. 
Because I can still see and feel fear while I have faith and wisdom in what God's Word says. It's an interesting dichotomy of life, but God created me human. Fear is a spiritual thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about fear like my body, my mind are racing. God created us with a sense of fear. It's called a defense mechanism. If you don't have fear in you, you are a psychopath and you need to go see a psychologist. Fear is normal, but I can also have faith and wisdom. So I don't make a decision based on the fears of others. Even if I get afraid, I make a decision based on what I know the Word of God says, faith and wisdom. Here's the difference. If I don't know the Word of God, I make a decision to please the crowd. If I know the Word of God, I make a decision based on faith and wisdom that pleases God. Saul was interested in pleasing the crowd. He wanted to please the men of Israel who had scattered instead of pleasing God and being obedient because he knew intimately what the word of God for his life was. The second thing is, not only are you moved by scatter, but when you don't know the word of God, you're moved by pressure. You're moved by pressure. He said, when I saw that you didn't come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling, you ever went to go buy a car? Let me rephrase that. You ever gone to just look at a car? And 18 hours later, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, and somehow you are trapped in that vestibule with that car dealer, and now you have a brand new car and $48,000 in debt that you knew you could not afford. How did that happen? Pressure. That pressure. Pressure. You need this. Oh, well, you can't afford it? It's okay. We'll give you 0.0% interest for for 18 months, and then, oh, but there's a balloon loan, and and there's there's just pressure, pressure, and and Saul felt the pressure. He felt the pressure. Why? Because the timing didn't work out exactly like he wanted to. Samuel, you said seven days. It's seven days exactly, I think, so I I had to do this. Uh, Oh, but, but the Philistines are building up, and my men have scattered. There's pressure, and so I'm moved by this. Let me give you an example. Uh, when, when you don't know what the word of God is, you'll begin moved by pressure. And here's the first thing that happens. When pressure happens, you bow to it. And you, you, begin, you begin to bow to it. I got two things here. This is a very simple illustration. Hopefully this will resonate with you. Come here, sir. Come here. You got these two things. This is a tissue. This is a rock. Can I show you what pressure actually is? It's simply... The wind of change. That's all it is. Plans deviated. This is how a lot of Christians live their lives, just so flimsy, don't know the word of God. I got no rock, I got no foundation. I've got no knowledge of what God says about my life. And so when the winds of change happen, gone. I could bring a leaf blower into this thing. This solid rock will not move. We're using wisdom here, otherwise I'd have like 15 other people help try to blow this. It still wouldn't move. (laughs) Give me a second, (laughs) y'all. I don't normally breathe that heavy. (laughs) See, when you know the Word of God, you're like this rock. The winds of change might happen, but you're not going to be moved by them. Samuel, you didn't show up when you were supposed to. I don't know how many times I've had this in my heart. And I'm going to talk about me, not you, because I know your situation is different. Um, I know none of you watching online, none of you here today, you, you have never gone, God, you didn't show up on time. God, you didn't answer this prayer by the time I needed it to. How do you know that? Well, because things got worse. Why did you make that decision? Because the pressure. God didn't show up when I I prayed that it would happen in 30 days, and it didn't happen in 30 days. Well, what you tried to do was you tried to pray to a God as a God, and you are not a God. You were pressured by that televangelist who told you if you sow that seed of $1,000 on your credit card, even though you can't even afford to sow a seed of $5 on that credit card, that God would wipe out all your debt in 30 days, and it didn't happen. And now you owe 28% interest for the next 10 years on that $1,000 because the televangelist told you too. You were pressured. Why did I wake up with that stranger next to me? Because you were pressured. 
And sometimes it's not even the pressure of other people. Sometimes it's the pressure of your own mind. Because if I don't intimate, get intimate with this person, no one will ever want me. This person must want me, so I'm just going to pressure, pressure, pressure. Are you conforming to other people's pressure about who you are? Do you let people speak about your sexuality, your gender, your choices, your lifestyle? Or do you know what the Word of God says about how you should live, who you should be, who God created you to be? Pressure. You're not just moved by scatter. You're not just moved by pressure, but you're also moved by Feelings, feelings. People love to talk about feelings in church. Remember I said you can feel things, but if you don't know what the word of God says, you are moved by feelings. Saul said, I felt compelled to do the burnt offering myself. Why? Because scatter had happened, pressure was happening, you didn't show up, and I love what the Bible says, just as he finished. In other words, it was 1201 on the seventh day. The seventh day hadn't completed, and he said, I gotta do it myself, I guess. I feel like I've gotta do it. And, and he tries to turn it around. It's really cute how he does this. I felt compelled to do the burnt offering so that I could seek God's favor. As if this was a noble thing. But he didn't really know the word of God. Because when you know the word of God intimately, when you receive the word of God, when you live by the word of God, you are not moved by the scatter of others' fears. You are not moved by the pressure of circumstances. And you show enough are not moved by your own feelings because when you know the word of God, you know that if he said it, it will happen and you can just sit back and revel in his glory. So I know that if he said it, I just got to be obedient in it. I'll tell you why it's so important to know the word of God. And I know y'all be here, so if I start crying, I'm sorry. And Wednesday morning, I got a phone call from a friend, a couple in our church, Misa and Dora Ruiz, and couldn't get a hold of him, tried to call back, and he picks up the phone, and, and it sounds like he's panting. He's like, uh, did, did so-and-so call you? I'm like, No. And he's like, I, I, I got to tell you something. And um, he texted me this morning, and I'll, I'll use his clarification, but this is my account of it first. I want to give you what is in my head as he's talking. Um, his wife had had headaches, and she was waking up. And if you know Dora, um, she's not one to complain. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> uh, she's not one to complain. She, she's just one to, like, push through things. And he said it was a severe pain. It began to bring her to tears even. And they go to the doctor. The doctor's like, ah, oh, it's just a headache, you know, sinus infection or whatever, whatever the doctor says. And so Misa finally had some wisdom, and he said, let's go to the ER. So they go to the ER, do an MRI, CT scan. Well, she has brain hemorrhaging. Her brain is bleeding. And uh, they prep her. They do all the things. The doctors are trying to figure out why it's bleeding. Of course, they do a COVID test because, you know, that's one of the symptoms, of course, because everything is COVID now. And he's just, I mean, can you imagine being in that situation? I've taken my wife to the ER. It's a scary situation. And, and especially, I, we didn't have this scenario, but when they come back and they're going, oh, your wife's brain is hemorrhaging. And so they're, he's like, man, you know, um, they're, they're, she's in observation right now. They're trying to figure out what's going on. And so he's kind of just recounting the events of the past couple days and the past couple hours and what's going on. And I can hear it in his voice that there are thoughts going through his mind that I won't even repeat from this platform, but you know you'd be thinking the exact same thing. I said, Misa, before you go, we're going to pray. He said, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And I begin to smack the devil around with faith, beat the mess out of him. She will live and not die in Jesus' name. She will proclaim God's glory. The doctors are going to find out exactly what it is. And if God doesn't heal her with a miracle, he's going to give the doctors wisdom to look at just the right things at just the right time. And in the so in the name of Jesus, she will live and not die. She's going to rise up. Okay. Absolutely, man. He said, dude, I, I, you know, I appreciate it. Appreciate the prayers. Calls me back the next day. Giving me an update. And he's telling me. He's like, it's hard. He, he said, I'm walking around downtown Dallas, 
and, and I'm like yelling at the devil. And it's interesting because no one is paying attention to me, so I'm pretty sure they think I'm just a crazy homeless guy. <laughs> but I'm like, but he said, I'm, I'm getting in elevators at the hospital and I'm having thoughts that I know are not from God. I know are not from God. How does he know they're not from God? Because he knows what God's word says. I know they're not from God, but I'm, I'm still battling. And it's hard, Stephen. It's hard. It's difficult. Let's be real here. All these preachers who are like, you just walk in favor, walk in grace. If you confess the wrong thing, well, it's your fault. You don't have enough faith. That's a load of crap. It's called being human. And he's battling these thoughts. And so again, we're going to pray, man. It's going to be all right. We're going to pray again, again. And so he texts me this this morning because I asked him permission, by the way. I didn't just share somebody's information. He said, this is pretty much how it all started. This is his This is his culmination of how he saw it. On Wednesday, Dora was admitted into the hospital with bleeding on the brain. She had a clot in a vein on what's called the venous side of the brain. That's actually where blood drains from your brain, but it was backing up. Listen to how his verbiage changed. This is today from Wednesday. God guided the hands and the plans of the doctors, the nurses, and the staff to pursue an aggressive procedure to run a catheter from her leg to the top of her brain to apply blood thinners directly to the source of the problem. Let me tell you how good God is. Within a couple of days, the vein was completely open and blood was flowing freely. In all caps, he said, to God be the glory. She's doing great right now in the hospital. She has full functionality of everything and is talking wonderfully. In fact, she was up and walking today. Come on, can we just thank God for a second? He said... Her eyesight on her left side is a bit blurred, but the same, listen to the, the distinction. Her eyesight on her left side is a bit blurred, but the same God that took care of the first issue will do the same thing with her eye. I spoke with the neurologist team this morning and CT scans came back stable. We believe that we will be out of the hospital in a few days. God is so good to us even when we haven't been. Come on, can we just thank God for that in Jesus' name? And here's what's so crazy about this, is he called me uh, Friday morning, and he's telling me, giving me these updates uh, of what had happened, because overnight, everything began to clear out, the blood began flowing, the brain begins healing, you know, miracles are happening. And he said something to me, and I hope me some, uh, you said I could share, so I'm going to share. He, he said something to me that just caught me off guard, and I could not shake it. He said, bro, I can't. I can't believe I'm saying this. He said, but I forgot how good God is. I just, I forgot how good God is. I forgot how good God is. I texted his oldest daughter and I shared with her, I said, remember this moment because your mom and dad have already walked through two miracles. Because Misa and Dora, before they gave birth to Audrey and Hannah, had problems with fertility. And I remember seeing both of their daughters to go to visit them in the hospital, and they're this little box in the ICU, and we have to put our hands through the gloves to touch them and stuff. And that's how I remember my first recollection of their daughters. And I said, your mom and dad have already walked through two miracles. But what brings us to, I, I had two miracles infertility to two births. They weren't easy, but God blessed us. To fast forward to today, man, I forgot how good God is. It's not a slight on him, but I know I've lived this before. Sometimes I forget how good God is because I forgot to pay attention to what his word says about his goodness. And church, I don't want to be a church that we forget how good God is. Because in every season, God is still good. He remains good. He is always good. He still sits on the throne. He's always a healer, even when the healing doesn't work out exactly like we wanted it to. So I didn't get an amen on that one. He's still good, even when we don't get the job we've been praying for. He's still good, even when the money doesn't come in for my stimulus check. 
Come on, somebody. He's still good when my candidate didn't win. Oh, he's still good because he's just good. He's still good when I wake up and I don't feel good in my body. Then I'm going to tell him he's still good. He's still good when the bills aren't paid. I'm going to tell him he's still good. He didn't stop being good. I just forgot what his word said about his goodness. What is missing? What is it that you need to know that you don't know? What is it in your situation right now that you have not brought to the word of God? You've been trying to bring it to the cross and not to your Bible. Oh, come on, somebody. You've been trying to bring it to an empty grave and going, I just speak resurrection over this, but you don't know what the word of God actually says about your situation. Are you getting back in the word of God? Because if you don't know what you don't know, you will continue. Continue in confusion, never have clarity, and you will forget that the goodness of God is every single moment of every single day, whether I'm awake or asleep, He is good all the time, all the time. God is good in Jesus' name. Come on, say amen to that. Now, I'm not just going to leave you hanging on that because y'all are like, oh, yes, but y'all ain't going to read your Bible. You lazy. I know y'all are lazy. So we're going to help you. We believe this year, this first step in our vision to become the church of 2030 is to help educate you on what the Bible says. And so we've joined with partners uh, called Right Now Media. And this is a service that the church is actually paying for, for you. It's going to be a free service to you, but because you give, we get to make this happen. And so if you're watching online or in person, um, Right Now Media is an online database of all kinds of different Bible studies. And there are some that are just like really awesome and production is really good. And there are some that are really good, but they'll bore the crap out of you. So just get ready for that, okay? But they have some amazing content there where you can learn from the Bible what the Word of God says. And you can actually study the Bible. Go deeper in it. You can download the app, and you can actually go in there, download the studies that you want to go through, listen to them while you're at the gym, listen to them at work. Like We want to give you this resource so that we can know what the Word of God says. They have things, everything from marriage to the Holy Spirit to healing to divorce. I mean, just anything you can think of, there's all this great content for us to just ingest and meditate on and focus on. And so what I want to encourage you to do, if you want to sign up for that, it's totally free to you. Just text right now space revive. Right now, one word, space revive to 41411. 41411. That'll give you access and you'll be able to see everything that you need there. You can download the app. They have an app for Apple TV, Roku, all that. Cameraman, don't you be downloading right now. You just pay, pay attention to me, sir. You just wait. And uh, we're, because <laughs> I'm about to move, you're going to be like, oh, I forgot. Uh, but download that um, because we want to resource you. And I want to encourage you, take the time to get into the word of God this year. Don't forget how good God is. Know what God says from his word, from the holy scriptures. It is profitable for your life. God, I thank you that your word is living and active. It is a double-edged sword. It pierces even down to bone and marrow, God. It separates the soul and the spirit to see what are we focused on. Do we know what your will says? Do we believe who you are and what you say about our lives? I pray today Lord, as people take action on this, as they sign up for Right Now Media, as they get back in their Bible, they start a Bible reading plan, whatever it is that they do, that, Lord, this year would be the year that we become the church of 2030 by educating ourselves, seeing the world through the Bible lens again, trusting your word, that your word would come alive for us in Jesus' name. And I thank you. I thank you for Dora and Misa. I know the situation was raw, but God, I thank you that you didn't just bring them out, but you're using it as a testimony for your glory in Jesus' name. I thank you that word that he said, I forgot how good God is. And I pray that that would not be the story of the people of Revived Church. I pray that all over the world, whoever is watching, as you would hear my voice today tell you, God is good. You may have never had an encounter with God. You may have never gone to church. This is the first time hearing about God. But I want to tell you, God is good. He's been good to me in my lowest points where I ran from him, where I disobeyed him, where I was steeped in sin. He's been good to me when I was on the mountaintop victorious and shouting about his goodness. He's never left me nor forsaken me. And it all comes down to Jesus. Jesus is the son of God sent from heaven down to earth. God became man so that we could see what a life 
of godliness, of holiness, of perfection look like, so we could see what a life lived with God looks like. Jesus came down so that we would know God is not some entity in the sky that's waiting to punish us, but he is a God who loves us and wants an intimate relationship with us. And not only that, but he's a God who would take the punishment that we deserve. In the Bible, it says that the wages of sin our disobedience from God's holiness is death, death in every area. Finances, emotions, your soul, your spirit, your marriage, your relationships, and ultimately your body, all this death around us, it's caused by sinful nature. It's caused by sinful choices. And we deserve death, and yet Jesus said, no, I'm gonna stop death in its tracks, and I'm gonna free you from the condemnation and the shame and the spiritual death that comes with sin, and I'm gonna die for you. He died for you. And the first step of experiencing God's goodness is knowing that the name of Jesus is the only name by which we can be saved. So here's what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. It says, if you believe in your heart, that not only did Jesus die, but he was raised from the dead. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord of your life, Lord means God, I'm serving you. You are number one. I look to follow you. Then you can be saved. It's not by anything you can do because you're just thinking, no, you don't know all the baggage I'm carrying into today. I totally get it, bro. My baggage was big, but Jesus said, you can leave that baggage behind and you can walk in freedom with me. And so I wanna lead you in a prayer. If that's you today, you know that you need to start a relationship with Jesus today to experience the goodness of God. I wanna lead you in a prayer very simply, line by line. You can just repeat after me today. And for the sake of everyone praying here in person and online, if we would just bow our heads and close our eyes, let's have some reverence for this moment. I want you to repeat after me. Let's pray this together. Say, Father God, I know I've sinned. I know I've messed up, but I ask for your forgiveness. I believe in my heart that you love me that you're a good God, that you sent Jesus to die for my sins, that he was raised from the dead, and that I can be forgiven. I thank you that today is the first day where I choose to follow you. I pray that you would direct my footsteps, order my thoughts, give me clarity on how good you are. And I can't do it myself, so I ask you, Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me that power that I need to say yes to you and no to sin, to leave the baggage of my past behind, to carry my cross into the future. I thank you that today, say it like you mean it, I am loved, I am forgiven, I am a child of God, and I will experience the goodness of God every day of my life in jesus name amen and amen listen if you prayed that prayer you might walk out your front door and you're gonna see that there are no rainbows and unicorns out there in fact the world is exactly the same what's changed is on the inside of you your spirit has been revived your soul is starting to be renewed god is doing a work in you so i want to encourage you this is not the last day of salvation this is a process it's a walk so connect with us get on social media follow us at revived church email us let us know that you prayed that prayer connect with us let's get you if you're local let's get you into a small group but we want to get you with some people that can help you walk together Here's the most important part. Don't just try to walk this out by yourself. Come back weekly. We're live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. We want you to be with us live. There are people you can chat with if you're online. If you're here in person and you're feeling comfortable, man, if you're not sick, come here today. Be a part of what God is doing in the church because when we come together, we learn together, we get on the same page together, we can always, when one of us forgets how good God is, the other one's there to go, no, let's speak faith over this and let's remember the goodness of God. In every valley, and every wilderness, God is still good. The Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. God, lift up your countenance upon your people, grant them grace and peace in Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week.